Okay. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Uh, we're going to begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for the Sabbath and uh, for the time that we have to study together your word. We invite your Holy Spirit to be here to teach us, to direct our minds, to direct this study. You know the things that we need to learn, the lessons that have been so hard um, for us to, to understand, our unwillingness to be corrected. We just pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can bring a strong conviction that we can see truly uh, our sin, we can understand um, from the light of the cross, the events that are happening and how we are tied together with those. We pray for each person who is studying these things. We know, Lord, that um, there's many trials that we face, many difficulties, but you have given them to us for our instruction so that we can learn to trust in you and not in ourselves. Be with us as we begin this study. We pray and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, well, good evening. And what you see in front of you is um, a document that I had emailed out uh, a couple of weeks ago. So it's the third angel's message is its title. And this is from the General Conference Bulletin. These are the sermons that A.T. Jones uh, gave in 1893. Now, after the 1888 General Conference, A.T. Jones, E.J. Wagner, and W.W. Uh, w. Prescott traveled with Ellen White to various camp meetings uh, presenting the message of righteousness by faith. And I don't know how many of you have ever read Prescott's sermons that were done. And I always wondered why Ellen White uh, endorsed what Prescott was saying, because it always seemed to me that Prescott was more a copier of Jones and Wagner, sort of trying to ride, uh, ride on their coattails than to being somebody who really was um, inspired that was really understanding what was being said. But that's, of course, my opinion. Um, we know W.W. Prescott's history later on, but at the time, um, I never really was impressed with anything he had to say. He didn't say anything that was particularly wrong, uh, but he just didn't have, seem to have the insight. Now, some people watching this may have read some A.T. Jones. A.T. Jones is a difficult read in some ways mostly because of his repetitious uh, way of speaking. Uh, that is, he, he repeats things with little slight variations uh, to get you to examine things more closely. And some people find it hard to read A.T. Jones because of that. They just feel like you know, he's just saying the same thing over and over. Um, but, but there is a point to it, of why he does it. Now, Wagner, Wagner's quite a bit different than Jones, and Wagner's, in some ways, easier to read. Though I always got more out of A.T. Jones than I did out of Wagner as well. But a lot of that could be just my own uh, natural way of thinking. Now, this is a long document. Um, this is all of A.T. Jones' General Conference sermons, and this document goes on for 960 pages. Um, I don't think it would be possible for us to really go through them in detail. Um, so we're going to uh, go through some of this, especially this introductory one. And then we're gonna start looking at um, what he says in 1893 and also the 1895 General Conference Bulletin. And those are the two that I'm interested in the most. Um, because of where they were written. I also do want to look at a Jones and Wagner's history and um, particularly their later history. Um, Jones ended up leaving the church, as many people know, 
um, well, he had his credentials removed, and he uh, there's some history there we're going to have to look at. And Wagner, of course, um, also left the church. And we're going to read his, uh, what I call his deathbed confession. It's the last thing he wrote. It was on his desk uh, when he died, and it was basically a confession of faith, it was entitled. Um, but basically is a rejection of Adventism. Now, sometimes when it comes to the issue of righteousness by faith, people will take up what happened to Jones and Wagner as a way of discrediting what they said. And what is the problem with that type of logic? Why would it matter what happened to Jones and Wagner? Um, if, how would that affect the message that they gave? It's more about the person than what they're saying. Okay. So it's about the person, but... I'm not sure what you're asking. Well, why is that a bad argument against what Jones and Wagner are saying? They're saying, well, Jones and Wagner fell away, so obviously they must have been teaching the truth. And why is that a bad argument? So they're using what occurred in the future to discredit the message that they had given contemporaneously with Mrs. White. Right. Mm -hmm. And also they're going to reject her endorsement of that message. Right. Now, and when we're going to look at it, so I'm, I'm just kind of giving this overall view of, of this history. Um, but in the 1888 General Conference, which, which we're going to look at, um, and, and I was trying to figure out where to start. I mean, I could have started there, but we're going to come back to there. Um, we know that there was all this jealousy going on uh, with Jones and Wagner. And um, Ellen White endorses this message of Jones and Wagner. And you'll see all of this caviling going on later on when we're in, in the 1980s, looking at Joe Wagner's message. So people will, um, they will take, because they'll say, we don't know what the general, what the, the, the message given because they didn't keep a record of it. So we don't have, a word-for-word -word account of the message that Jones and Wagner gave in 1888. They hadn't been doing, uh, you know, copying, because basically back then they didn't have recorders or videos. So in order to keep track of it, somebody would transcribe uh, uh, the presentations. So they would take word-for-word. -word. I can't remember the word they use for that, but um, people who do that. Manuscripts. No, there's a person who who listens and writes it down. Um, I can't remember what they're called. <laughs> anyway, I can't think of the word. Anyway, people know what it is. They can look, look it up. Stenographer. Stenographer, that's it. Yes. Okay. So they had stenographers taking these notes. And, and it's interesting, too, because even, uh, like, you don't see a lot of people who do that nowadays. That skill is disappearing because of recording and videos. Mm -hmm. um, but stenographers, there was many stenographers, they would have to take, uh, you know, if there's uh, political speeches, they would record these word for word. Um, and uh, so they didn't have that in 1888, at least not for the general conference. The Adventist church wasn't as large as it was in 1893. So by 1893, they had the stenographers taking record of everything that was being said. Um, in these public presentations, but that didn't happen in 1888. So people will say, well, we don't know what the 1888 message was, but of course we have what Jones and Wagner wrote before 1888, and we also have what they wrote after 1888. And we can see there isn't a change. So it's, it was a very strange argument. And one of the persons who put forward this argument was Leroy Froome. So he would argue that, you know, we don't really have that but we do have the book Christ Our Righteousness by Wagner, or sometimes called The Righteousness of Christ, or Christ and Our Righteousness. Um, and it's three different titles, Australian and American, and uh, I think a European edition, English edition. Anyway, they have different titles. 
Um, but it's the same book, and it is basically what Wagner presented in 1888. And so uh, Froome does kind of admit that. But there's sort of this idea that we have this um, sort of ephemeral kind of message that was given, and nobody really knows what it was. And uh, um, so we have to reconstruct it. But I, I don't think that that's really a problem. You know, it wasn't something, you know, mystical that happened and there's this message that somehow just disappeared and nobody knows what was said in 1888. It's well known what was said. So this General Conference Bulletin articles, um, by 1893, Jones is having to deal with these arguments that have, are being brought against what he and Wagner have been saying. And so a lot of this is um, from the study having to do with this, this problem that they presented this message. And now Jones is tr trying to uh, present it in a way that people are going to be able to see what they have been saying for the last, you know, five, six years. Um, and, and so some of what he is saying is really to respond to arguments that were being made at the time. <clears throat> but we're going to start reading this, and uh, we'll be commenting. We won't just be reading. And if people have questions, of course, um, feel free to join in and ask those questions, or if you have comments. As we begin our Bible study, I think it would be well to spend this hour, at any rate, in considering what we came for and how we are to come to get any good, I suppose that everyone came expecting to hear things we never thought of before. And not only expecting to hear things we never thought of before, but expecting to learn things we never thought of before. It is very easy to hear things we have never thought of before, but we do not always learn what we hear. But I suppose we have come expecting to learn things we never thought of before. It is simply saying we have come expecting the Lord to give us new revelations of himself, of his word, and of his way altogether. I have come for this. This text is good advice for us all. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. Mark 10, 15. Thus we have come to learn of the kingdom of God, to reckon, to receive things of the kingdom of God, things new and old, old things in a new way, and new things in a new way. Whosoever shall not receive it as a little child shall not enter, cannot have it. Hence, um, we are all to come here and to sit down at the feet of Christ, looking to him as our teacher, expecting to receive what he has to tell us, coming as a little child, who would receive the kingdom of God. But in Matthew, it is put in such a way as to cover all the time after we receive the kingdom of God first. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 18, 1 to 3. Now, if anyone should say that the other text refers to any who are receiving the kingdom of God for the first time and admit the truth that they can receive it only as a little child, confessing that they know nothing of it themselves and cannot bring themselves to a knowledge of it, this verse shows that it goes beyond that and that the idea goes with it, even after we have received the kingdom of God. For in order to be converted, we are to be as little as a little child, receive the kingdom of God as a little child, allowing that we know nothing of ourselves, no wisdom of our own. It is not our own wisdom that can make it plain to us, can open the way by which we can understand it all right as it is. We must leave all our wisdom out in order to gain it and by being converted, become as a little child. Except you be converted and become as a little child, you shall not enter the kingdom of God. What kind of children are mentioned? Little children. 
Little children have not much pride of opinion of their own. Grown up ones are not so ready to learn. Then this is spoken as giving us a model and example as to how we are to come to the word of God to learn. There is another verse that tells us the same thing and perhaps in a more forcible manner. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know it. 1 Corinthians 8, 2. How many people does that cover? Any man, all of us that have come here. Anyone then who has come here, will it refer to us personally as that? Everyone, any one of us then who have ever come, who have come here that thinks he knows anything. How much does that cover? Thinks he knows how much? Thinks he knows what? Anything. Does that cover all things then? Yes, sir. Then the text covers all people and all things that may be known. Then if any one of us thinks he knows anything, what does he know? How much does he know? He knows nothing yet as he ought to. Now, of course, you can see the problem here with Jones. It's very repetitious. But what he is doing, uh, how would we describe what Jones is doing in the way that he presents this? So, I mean, this is kind of an aside the point of, of what he's saying. Um, but why is he doing this? Is there a repeat and enlarge method? It's kind of a repeat and enlarge, yeah. Now, he's dealing with people who have shut themselves off from the Spirit of God to instruct them. That is, these are people who think they know things. Now, how effective do you think Jones' presentations would be to those, this is just a supposition, but to those who um, are resistant to the Holy Spirit? Do you think his presentations would be effective or ineffective? I think to an open and willing heart, Jones' presentations would have had great impact. Right. But those that chose not to give up their idols would have had great difficulty because they would have chosen to resist and resist strongly. And, and they would see the way that Jones is presenting almost... They could take it condescendingly, mm -hmm. correct? I can see that. Like he's te he's talking to them like they're idiots. I mean, well, it, it, it's either that they would see him as approaching this condescendingly, or that he was approaching them combatively. Right mm -hmm. now, some would take this as because we know the context in which this is written, and I think part of the thing that I see about Jones is I look at myself and I can see how I've often been ineffective when I'm trying really hard to communicate to people an idea because, and, and people have told me this, that I'm condescending, you know, maybe, I, I don't think I am, but I can see how if somebody has already had an opinion about me, and about what I'm saying, that I could see with Jones, I can see how people would be very resistant. You know, he's treating me like I don't know anything. And of course, he's all, it's also very irritating because he's, he's doing this as an argument now. Well, you think you know something, that means you don't know anything. And, and so how do you argue against him? What you would have to do is disagree with his whole argument. Let us also recall yeah. that Jones was using a writing and speaking style that was not in disfavor at the time in which he gave his presentations. He wanted people to either stand up and say, I agree or no. I disagree. Mm -hmm. His choices were to allow those that
that disagreed to present their points. Yeah. And for them to address their points in such a manner so that others could see where they were coming from. He, he's laying everything down on the table. It, well, that's that's one way of saying it. Yes. And, and he's drawing these people into this discussion. So but you can see how some people are going to take it differently. Well, especially those. Let, let's also recall Jones had been in the army when he began studying his Bible in earnest. Yeah. So would we say that Jones was a man? educated according to the world at that time not really so when you have a man like jones who in a way is a type of a successor to william miller mm. he draws more flack because those like um, Uriah Smith, like George Butler, like many others who had sought what they saw as advanced education degrees mm -hmm. would have even been more condescending to someone like Jones than they would have been to anyone else. Mm -hmm. So when Jones is presenting something that literally was being led by the Holy Spirit, they became alarmed because this uneducated Western cowboy mm -hmm. now has a better grasp of the gospel than they do. Mm -hmm. we can't afford that because his version is going to create issues where people are no longer going to give us the accolades that we so greatly desire mm -hmm. we want the praise of men we don't care if we are receiving the praise of god right yeah and, and and, and I think you, you know, hit the nail on the head there with, with the problem. Now, the other thing, though, is we know that this exists with people who are educated, right? So the scholar thinks he knows things. But this type of thinking is not, um, is not limited to just those who are educated. We can have also a type of anti-scholarship where people just trust in their own opinions and their views and that anything that disagrees with their thinking must be wrong. And, and so they would have, have to um, have some way of forming why that type of thinking is wrong. So I, I'm not expressing myself really well here, but um, I have seen where you have people who are not informed they haven't really studied God's word. Um, they claim that they have, but they think they know a lot more about the Bible than they really do. I mean, this would be me before I came into this movement. Before I came into this movement, you know, I mean, I was educated in, in, a little bit in university, but mostly in music and religious studies. I wasn't, I wasn't a scholar and, um, uh, so I had studied on my own. I had read all this information, Jones and Wagner and, and all this stuff. I'd studied deeply into righteousness by faith um, and, and this history of 1888. And, and I'd studied my Bible, you know, diligently for years. But when it came to coming to this movement, the one thing I saw is that I didn't know anything. And I still don't. The more if you study and you come to understand the truth, you start to realize how little you know. And we can see this clearly over this time that we've spent the last couple of years 
I guess now it's um, yeah about two years and a half since we started studying in um, these daily studies. And how much did we know about the Bible before we started this course of study? I can say almost nothing. I mean, there's so many and, and so many things that we have thought we understood that we didn't understand correctly. But there are some who will not be corrected by anyone. They're never going to take this approach that I need to be corrected. So if somebody differs from them of their darling opinion, that person is going to be torn down, just as Jones and Wagner were. So, so his situation may differ from uh, what's happening in this movement today, but I think it's very similar. Even if it's, you know, this isn't the leadership of the church. But we can see that it happens even in smaller groups. That people want to be in charge. Or they want to be the ones that are heard. They want their opinions to be heard. And if somebody comes with an opinion that differs, they're ready to tear that person to pieces. So, so even though this is about righteousness by faith, the one thing that we need to understand that he's laying down here as a principle is that we don't know anything just like we are not righteous. So we could call this uh, wisdom by faith or knowledge by faith. In order to understand the truth, we have to approach it just as we do anything else. We're not righteous and we're not omniscient. We are sinful creatures. We're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Without Christ dwelling in us, we actually have no understanding whatsoever. So to be as a child is to be converted, to be open, to be taught, to be learned, to learn of the things, to learn of the kingdom of God, to take up our cross, and follow Christ. So let's go on and read some more here. Well then, we will all assent that this is true, shall we? Just set that down for yourself. If you came here thinking you knew something, you must decide you do not know that as you ought to know it. Then shall we come to this study in that way? Shall we come to this study tomorrow, next day, each time we come here and just settle it in our minds that we do not know anything as we ought to know it. I do not care if it is the oldest minister in our ranks. He must come and say, I do not know anything yet as I ought to know it. Teach thou me, and we will learn. Everyone that comes to this house that way will learn something every lesson he hears. And this includes the same oldest minister in the ranks. He will learn more than any of the rest of us if he sits down like that. But how long a time does that text cover? How long will it remain there? Will we go beyond that time during this institute think, thinking? No, sir. Very good then. We have that settled for the whole institute if we thought we knew anything. And there are some things we thought we knew pretty well. If there's one thing we thought we knew, just put it down. We don't know anything. We are always learning the most out of those texts that we already know best. Don't forget that. So what is he saying here about the things that we need to learn? Those aren't the things that we haven't heard. They're the things that we've, we've actually studied the most where we are going to learn the most if we're open. Does that, does that make sense to people why that is? Sometimes when we are learning and going over this, these things multiple times, we don't always grasp the, what the ultimate lesson really is. Right. So, so we come to study something, um, and I've done this. I've studied some things in great detail, and all of a sudden something will come along, some idea, some verse, and I will start to see what was behind everything that I had been studying. 
And, and this is what happened to me when I came into this, this movement. I had studied the sanctuary. I had studied righteousness by faith. I had studied um, all kinds of things in the scriptures. But I'd studied Adventism. I knew the prophecies. But when I came into this movement, I saw that I knew nothing. But could I have seen that if I had never studied all of those things? Would I have been able to receive that insight if I had just come completely ignorant of anything about Adventism? So you see the point that the more we have studied, the more we have learned, those are the areas, the areas that we have studied are the places that we need to learn the most. So in this movement, do we know a lot? Have we studied a lot of things? Yes, we have covered a lot of ground. Do we know, do we really understand what it is that God is teaching us? We have a lot yet to go to be able to truly grasp trying to teach us. And the one thing he's trying to teach us more than anything else is what Jones is presenting here, that we don't know anything, that we aren't righteous, that we have nothing to recommend ourselves to God, that we have no reason that we should even be here learning these things because of some merit that we have, because of our intellect or because of how much we have studied or because of our position in, in the movement or anything. We should be learning this because the 144,000 have no pride in them. They have no sense that they are better than anyone else. They have come to the point where they can see how unworthy they are, how sinful they are, how in need of Christ they are. They do not trust in their own selves. And that is what has to happen. It's not just something that we have happen in our initial conversion, it's something that has to be our, I, I can't even think of the word of it. It's just our, our, our self-awareness that is always there. <clears throat> so when he says, you know, we are always learning the most out of those texts that we already know best, I think this is a very profound insight. Um, when I'd read this years ago, because I'd read Jones' uh, 1893 General Conference Bulletin, well, a few times, but, uh, and I, I remember it quite well, this sermon is particularly. Um, but this, this is something I never picked up, um, this idea. We are always learning the most out of those texts that we already know best. And, and he says, don't forget that. Well, I definitely forgot that when he said it. Um, we are always learning the most out of the text with which we are already the most familiar. So he just says the same thing. Then don't you see that any one of one who takes any text or thought and studies upon it for a long time and thinks he has got all the thought out of it that is in it, he just shuts himself off there? When he says, now I know it, he shuts himself off from learning what is really in that text. Brother Porter here in the lesson of the previous hour spoke to us of God's purpose in making known to us these things. What kind of purpose was that spoken of? An eternal purpose. And the scripture is God's expression of God's thoughts on that purpose. In carrying out and setting forth and making known that purpose. Well then, what kind of purpose is it? Eternal. How deep then are his thoughts? How far reaching is that purpose? Eternal. 
How deep then are the thoughts expressed in the scriptures? Eternal. In how many expressions in the scriptures and in how many scriptures is the thought of eternal depth? In how many passages? Every one. And it does take all the scriptures that are written for the Lord to express to us what he wants to tell us of his eternal purpose? Yes, sir. Then how deep is the thought in each passage of scripture and the words that are used to tell it? Eternal. Then just as soon as any man catches one of these thoughts and thinks, I know it now and I've got it, how far short is he? How far short is he from having the thought that is really there, from having the thought that is in that passage? The voices in the audience say, as far as his mind is from God's mind. And then he says, I have the truth. I have the thought. He has shut up his own mind from the wisdom of the knowledge of God, putting himself and his own mind in the place of God and his thoughts. The man that does that cannot learn anymore. Don't you see that at that instant he shuts himself out forever from learning? And the man who does that, of course, can learn nothing beyond himself. And of course, will never have the knowledge of God. So, I mean, we can see what, what uh, Jones is saying here. And, and we can see, especially as we have continued studying in this movement, that we thought we knew things, and now we realize there is a lot to study that the scriptures have in this in them this eternal depth and that's why we can take um you know judges and we can see in it through god's inspiring us because it's only through inspiration that we would have seen this that the book of judges relates to this movement at the pre present time but the book of judges doesn't just relate to this movement at the present time it relates to all kinds of histories. We just happen to be seeing what God is showing us now. Correct? And, and think about that. Think about how God could have written these scriptures, inspired these writers to write down this history. And for the details the symbolism that exists in the book of Judges, how it is so possible that it fits at this moment what we are experiencing, that it describes our history and our present and our future. But yet, it only doesn't just embody that. It embodies other histories. Other people at other times would have had the same opportunity to read the book of Judges and to see in the book of Judges their history. Some people have noted that when you look at a book like Prophets and Kings, even though this is published after Ellen White's death, these articles are written, of course, when she was alive. And in this, people can see that she is taking the story of the scriptures, this history of the kings, and you can see the parallels to what was happening at the time that she wrote these scriptures. So that means the stories of the kings of Judah applied to the Seventh-day Adventists in the early 1900s. But do those also apply to us today? All things that were written aforetime were written for our learning upon whom the end of the world has come. All these things are written as in samples or types. And so we are experiencing how deep the Bible is as we go through these studies. And of course, as we experience these things, the Bible comes alive to us. But no one of us can say all of these things we found were just the product of our wisdom and understanding. All of these things that we are learning come from God teaching us. And God's teaching all kinds of people these things individually in ways that they can understand and that they can then share with others. The expressions of thought conveyed in the statements of the scripture are as eternal depths. And so we cannot, we cannot put a limit 
at what the scriptures can present. We have been in a good while, and let us be careful that we do not think we know something. Let us be sure that we have not been inveigled into the idea of thinking that we know something as we are to know it. Let us just settle it now by the word of God that we do not know that, that thing at all. There is knowledge in each line of thought for us to catch. And until all the depths and eternities are passed, we will never get to the place where we will have the right to think we know that thing and are done with it, shall we? Well then, I am glad to know that we have such a subject as that to study upon in such a length of time as that, eternity, in which to study it. Well then, let us be glad to start with. That text is going to remain with us as long as we are in the world at least, and it won't go, and it won't go then. It will go in this shape, of course. The Bible, the Word of God is put up in this shape, will go. No doubt these Bibles will be burned up just as any other book of paper and leather. But the Word of God will not be burned up. That text in this shape, in print, will last as long as the world does. But after that, it will still exist in this shape, the body. Then that text will still remain with us all the time, even eternally. And if any man think he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. No, no man knows it. Are not you glad, brethren, that are not you glad? Now, we can think about what Jones is saying here. That the words of God are eternal, and they're eternally true. Do we accept that? We need to accept it. And, and since they're eternally true, they are really beyond man's ability to understand apart from what the Holy Spirit is going to show us at any given time. So that means we're always dependent upon the Holy Spirit to continue to give us light upon the scriptures. The Holy Spirit doesn't just inspire us about a scripture and we see it, and then the Holy Spirit stops showing us that. The Holy Spirit has to continue to show us that thing that we thought we were understanding. And that will always be true. God's word will always be studied on a deeper and deeper level throughout eternity. <clears throat> so Jones, Jones goes on, he says, but we must not linger too long upon any one of these texts, for there are several texts we want to bring up tonight. Taking the thought we had a moment ago, we have come here expecting to learn many things that are new and many new things about what we have learned formerly. We have not come, though, to learn anything but the truth. That is what we want. The only thing there is any power in, the only thing there is any good in, the only thing there is any sanctifying force in is the truth, the truth as it is in Jesus, of course, because there is no truth in any other way. Then coming with that purpose, we know only the truth, that is, all we are to study, that is, all we are to ask about. It is none of your business or mine whether a thing be old or new, or who says it in this institute, or whether it is for us to study or for anyone else, is it? The thing for us to ask is, is it true? Now this is, um, of course, something we are familiar with in this movement. Um, when we presented the 2520 to friends and in the church, and the church heard about the 2520, what was it, what question were they asking about the 2520? Were they asking, is it true? No. So what were they asking? What do people ask when they don't want to know whether it's true or not? Why would you why would you believe this fable? Yeah. Well, often they'll ask, who is advocating it? Right? Agreed. It's Jeff Pippinger. As if Jeff Pippinger is the only one who ever believed the 2520. And and since he believes it. It can't be true. 
Well, we've heard this argument in Adventism, haven't we? Um, if you talk about the state of the dead, well, wouldn't you hear, well, that's a Jehovah's Witness teaching, correct? Have you ever heard that? I can't say that I have. Well, I have. Um, and also, the 2520, isn't that a Jehovah's Witness teaching? Don't they believe the 2520? Some have tried that, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, the Jehovah's Witnesses believe a version of the 2520, and, and that's really what uh, Uriah Smith uh, ultimately is arguing against in the book Daniel and Revelation, is the applications of the 2520 that were being used for time setting in his day. But I've had people who just argue, well, the Jehovah's Witnesses believe the 2520, so it can't be true. But can people who believe wrong things also believe true things? Very easily. Yes, because we, we ourselves believe wrong things and also believe true things. So for somebody to argue against something that someone is saying based upon who is saying it and what that person believes about other things is making a fool's argument. The question that we have to ask is, is it true? Now, when we ask that question, he's going to go on and talk a bit about this, but we have a particular way of understanding whether something is true. So he says, if it be true, then take the Lord's word as he has given it to us. No difference by whom he says it, no difference in what way it comes, no difference if it comes in exactly the opposite way in which we expected it to come, and the probabilities are that it will, for your ways are not my ways, said the Lord, then when we have a way fixed up, we may expect it to come another way. The Lord will not allow, um, the Lord will not allow anyone to dictate to him or to lay out plans for him. We may take the Lord in that text, O God, verily thou art a God that hidest thyself. But we can see him. He will hide himself. We cannot fix the ways in which he is going to do. But the best of it is, we will let him have his own way to do things. And we will be in a position to do it all the time. Then we will be perfectly safe. Then we will never need to have any anxieties never to have anything to do with the management of it ourselves. He is all wise, everything goes straight with him, and we simply keep, keep ourselves ready to see him do it at any time. And we have nothing to do but to enjoy ourselves in seeing him do things. I've been greatly blessed in the study of the Bible and in watching the Lord do things. And when it is the darkest, the most mysterious, then it is the best study because it takes us clear out of ourselves to see him do it. If we could just see how it was coming out always, it would not seem interesting. When it is the darkest, we can watch the more intently and with more interest to see the Lord straighten it out. So Jones is saying that, um, that the things that are the most difficult, basically, to understand in God's word, the things that are darkest and it's not like we're look for speculative things that God hasn't shown us but the things that uh, are hidden by God in his word that we have been studying are amazing it's amazing that it's there it's amazing that we have passed over these scriptures a thousand times and not seen the gem that has been hidden. You know, because we're miners, we're looking for gold, we're looking for diamonds, we're looking for gems in God's word. And it's like a miner who on his way to his gold mine has passed this nugget a thousand times and kicked it with his feet, thinking it was just a normal rock. And finally, one day he finds out that this is a gold nugget that would make him rich. And that's how God's word is. So we have to approach God's word 
in a way that we um, we're not prone to naturally. Now, the problem with modern scholarship um, in this respect, what is the problem with modern scholarship? And maybe, maybe all scholarship to some degree. What's the problem that we have when we study the Bible? What, what do we do as human beings, generally? We put in man's wisdom in place of God's. Right. So, and we can do this in lots of different ways. I mean, we don't need to be a scholar to do it. Um, we can just say, well, the church teaches this particular thing this way, and we need to accept what the church says. And it might even be that what the church says is the truth. But that doesn't mean that the church has said all that there needs to be said about that thing. And that if we don't open our minds and our hearts to be not just corrected, but to receive light, we might as well not have known anything. Because what does Ellen White say about new light in Christ Object Lessons? Uh, she talks about new light. And she says it's an unfolding of? Old light. Old light, right? Now, if somebody doesn't see the new light, does he understand the old light? No. Yeah. So even though that old light is truth and that person believes that he understands it, when new light comes and he rejects it, it's evident that he never actually understood the old light. How, can the, this movement run into that problem as well? Definitely. Because when we have studied the foundation of this message, we have come to see things that we never saw before. And some people have taken those things and said, they're teaching error. They're rejecting uh, the foundation of the message. But it's things that we found by studying the foundation of the message. An example would be Revelation 17. We had an idea about Revelation 17, which God has showed us, and that idea is correct. But he also showed us other things that to others seems to be a rejection of our understanding of Revelation 17. But we would know that it's not because we understand the old light better by accepting the new light. So I think this is an extremely important point, just in the study of prophecy itself, but in the Bible in particular. So then we are to learn the truth only. No difference who speaks it. The Lord will speak it, of course. No difference by whom it is spoken or the way it comes. If we knew it before, thank God somebody else knows it now. And if we did not know it before, then thank the Lord we now know it. The only thing is to ask is, is it true? You all know those verses in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 9 and 10. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth. Anyone who loves the truth and will receive the love of the truth, Satan will nav never have any chance to work in with all signs and lying wonders and all deceivableness of unrighteousness no sir because jesus has said it ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free then everyone who receives the love of the truth this will make them free then the one in whom satan is to work all signs and lying wonders is he free no he is a fearful slave as long as we have it settled in our minds that the only thing we shall ever seek or expect is the truth and love it because it is the truth, and take it because it is the truth, then we need not be uneasy about whether Satan is going to deceive us or not. 
Now, I have, I have run into people who reject truth for, by saying they don't want to be deceived. I mean, I'm sure that you've run into people in that way. That is, one of their arguments against light that they have never seen is that maybe the church isn't teaching it, or maybe it's something that's difficult to understand, but they don't want to be deceived. But how is it that we, we are deceived? He's talking here about how we receive the truth, but how is it that we are be deceived? What causes deception? A lot of times it's holding on to things that we think are truth, but we haven't really studied them in line with God's word, like comparing God's word to what we hold as a creed, right? I know I went through that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And, and so we know that, that um, we, could, we can hold on to something that's not true, but can we be deceived by holding on to things that are true? Yes, because then we don't want to advance further. And you know what? All As you're reading this, I'm thinking of John chapter 9, where the Pharisees threw the blind, the formerly blind guy out. Are, you were entirely born of sins, and dare you teach us? And they cast him out. And by doing so, they had cast themselves out from learning anything new from advancing spiritually. Yeah. Yeah, because there is this, it's called epistemology. How do we know what is true? And, you know, that's a part of a philosophy, a philosophical idea. How do we know that something is true or not? Now, the Bible tells us how to know whether something is true or not. So how does the Bible to tell us whether something is true or not? How do we know? I mean, we've dealt this with this idea quite a bit. You know, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. So how do we know that something is true? How do we know that something is light? Well, as we were saying, comparing new light to old, I mean, usually it's just a repeat and enlarge. Okay. And somehow, sometimes I just know something is true, like when I'm, trying to reach something and I say, Lord, please give me the scriptures or the paraphrasing of the scriptures, something that will reach this person's heart. And he does it all the time. Okay. Like his spirit will wit wit witness as it were with my spirit, you know, and the person will start to open up and respond properly. Okay. But that doesn't, I mean, what you're saying is true. But the, the scripture that I'm talking about is men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And if we take that um, as, um, as representing how we understand the truth, right? So John 1 verse 5 says, and the light shineth in the darkness and the darkness comprehendeth it not. And in John 3, 19, and this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Now, this darkness and light illustration, of course, is part of a reform line, right? Because you have a period of darkness, and you have this light. The first message comes. There's an increase of light. And this light is going to cause this uh, two groups, two classes of worshipers to be um, developed and also demonstrated right so that's that's how um that's the everlasting gospel so if something is true we know it is true based upon the fact that it does what according to this scripture what does the truth what does light do that we can know that it is light Faces away the darkness. Right. So light is going to reveal 
error, right? It's going to reveal sin. Right. And so if something comes to me, I'm studying God's word, and I now have a conviction of sin, I see myself as a sinner, then I know that what God has revealed to me is light. But if what I see makes me think of myself better than I am, or makes me think that I'm better than other people, it, it may even be, be some truth mixed with it, but it's still darkness because it hasn't yeah. exposed my sin. Angela? Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I, I, I mean, sometimes we'll, I know I've done this in the past. I've claimed a scripture and claimed it wrongly because I had this pre presumptuous feeling that if I stood on this scripture, then this would occur for me, right? And the results were disastrous down the line. So I've learned, no, Lord, you better just reveal to me or help me to stand on something that is according to your will, not my will. It's worked out a lot better for me since I learned that. Yeah. I mean, in this movement, we have seen light presented to people in this movement. And they rejected that light. And when they do that, what is the common thing that a man does when he rejects light? What does, what does man have to do in order to reject light? How does he act? What does he, he say? He attacks the person who's giving that light. They're going to attack. He closes the door to him. Yeah, all the time. I've just been through that, so. <laughs> and you're, and you're going to see. Right? And you're also going to see that that person is going to manifest a spirit of self righteousness, is he not? Oh, extremely. They will justify themselves, and I've seen it happen a thousand times. Somebody will reject some light because it disagrees with what they understand. And the thing is, it's different if somebody rejects error. Because the attitude of a person who, who sees error and corrects it is very different from the ad attitude of a person who sees light and rejects it. And why is that? Why does a person who is being confronted by error, why does he not have to act in the same way as a person who is confronted with something that is light and rejects it? Doesn't somebody that rejects um, light or more get offensive or kind of they go, go on a defense kind of mentality? Yeah. They need to be on the defense. And why do they need to be on the defense? Um, well, I can't put it in words, but. <laughs> okay, so somebody who knows something is true, who's had light revealed to them, and they can see that it reveals to them their sin. They don't need to be, on, they don't need to be defensive. They can be open to God. They can know that something is true. They can trust in it. But if I've rejected light, do I have what do what do I have to trust in? Well, yourself, ourselves. Right. And and can we really trust in ourselves? Do we really trust ourselves? <laughs> I'm learning that every day, not to trust myself. <laughs> yeah. We have to justify ourselves, you know, to sort of whip up some kind of of idea that we we, we didn't reject light because we're special. We know the truth, and we have to tear down the other person who has presented that light. But it's not the same way when somebody has presented error, because when somebody has presented error, and you can see it's error because you know the truth, and you can see that what that error is doing to that person, you have a completely different attitude towards that person who's presenting error when you believe the truth than somebody who rejects light their attitude towards that person who has presented that light is very different. And that spirit that is manifest when people present light and it's rejected is a satanic spirit. We saw it with the 2520, did we not? 
We saw yes. this, we saw the spirit of Antichrist be manifest against people who were presenting light. But when people present error, the church doesn't actually have that same difficulty. It's very easy to see that something is error. They don't need to expend so much energy. Now, people, there are people who expose error, and it's easy to do. You can actually look at the arguments that someone is saying and compare them with Scripture and show why they're incorrect. But when somebody's presenting truth, you can't do that. You have to create a straw man argument. You have to misrepresent what that person is saying. Correct? Yes. Yes. And mostly you're going to completely shut them down. Right? Because if they could present what they're saying, you're scared because people might hear it and believe it and recognize that it's the truth. You don't have to shut down error. Error will always reveal itself for what it is. And if you know the truth, you don't need to be scared of error. So, so this is a problem that, that we have seen in the church and in this movement, that when people are censured, when people are shut down, it's evidence that, the, that they're presenting light. When we, when we address each of their arguments openly and honestly, we can only do that if we know that we have the truth. And also, we can only do that if we're willing to be corrected. Right? Because when Ellen White talks about this, you know, if we differ with a brother, you know, we have to look at what they're saying. We don't represent them as a heretic. We don't uh, uh, misrepresent their words. No, because, no personal attacks either, you know. Because we may be in error, right? We may need to be corrected, right? Could be, yeah. So, so this is a problem that we face, and, it, and it's an important in understanding righteousness by faith and understanding the history of the 1888 message. Because the problem that we are trying to, to show is that we don't understand righteousness by faith. That is, righteousness by the, the third angel's message is righteousness by faith in verity. It doesn't mean that the first and second angel's messages aren't righteousness by faith. They are, because they're the first two steps in the everlasting gospel. And isn't the everlasting gospel the message of righteousness by faith? Yes, most assured. Mm -hmm. So if it is, then one thing we can say is if we're only preaching the third angel's message, which Jones is preaching the third angel's message, but he's preaching the third angel's message in a time in which the first and second angel's messages have been rejected. And the argument that people make against Jones is, well, he wasn't really truly converted. But he wasn't really truly converted, and neither was Wagner. In the end, we can see that they fell away to some degree. But we know that they weren't truly converted, not because they weren't teaching the true message, but because that message was not preceded by the first and second angels' messages. And if we try to go back to Jones and Wagner and say, we're just going to read Jones and Wagner, and that's all we need to do to get the third angel's message, well, we're going to make a mistake because we're going to make the same mistake Jones and Wagner made, not because what they're saying is not true, but because it's not placed in the proper context. That is, the third angel's message in Verity is a revelation of the character of Christ in his people. Jeff, you have a comment? Well, I was thinking of Uri some people look at Uriah Smith like that. They just go by Uriah Smith and some others. Yeah. But we know that we're in a different time than, than Jones and Wagner were. We're in a time in which the first and second angel's messages have been repeated. 
And we have some in our movement who want to just study righteousness by faith and what their idea of medical missionary work is. And they don't like all of this prophecy stuff. I mean, it has its place, they would say, but it's not our message. But we know that in order to understand what God wants to show us, we have to go through an experience that shows us that we're not where God wants us to be. That we're not who we think we are. Well, if, we, if we're supposed to have the spirit of prophecy, you know. <laughs> yeah. No, and, and so this is what God's been showing us. And what we're trying to do in this, because we're going to go through a lot of this history. But what we should be able to see is that Jones was teaching the truth. But we still, did he fully understand, based on his own words, could he have known all of the truth? No. No, and we don't either. But God wants to bring a people that are going to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator, and he can't do that with people who are going to hold on to the idea that they understand what is true, that they are the ones who are the, the arbiters of truth, that they're the ones who are the gatekeepers of truth, and that if somebody's teaching something that isn't true, they can shut them down. They can push them out. And we can never do that. Because if we know the truth, we know that the truth is more powerful than error, and that the truth can always bear investigation, and we can't end up doing the same thing that happened to us. The movement did the same. They treated uh, people in this movement worse than they were treated by the church. And this is about righteousness by faith. Righteousness by faith is not some intellectual idea about the nature of Christ and overcoming sin. It's about an experience that, that Jones is describing here. It's about how we approach God's word, how we approach light. Are we willing to see ourselves as we truly are? And to see God as much as it is possible for us to see him as he is. You know, that's really the question of righteousness by faith. So we don't need to be uneasy about whether Satan is going to deceive us or not. Because I know people who are fearful about being deceived. But we don't need to be fearful of Satan deceiving us. We need to be fearful about ourselves deceiving ourselves more than Satan deceiving us. The question is, are we willing to see ourselves as we truly are? There's no way that we're going to be able to be uh, not deceived if we are are not willing to see ourselves as we truly are. Because light is going to reveal our, our condition, our spiritual condition. Deception will flatter us. It'll make us feel better about ourselves. This is the problem I have with conspiracy theories, just to bring them up. Because the problem I always has had with conspiracy theories really didn't have to do with with all the details of who's right and who's wrong, it was the spirit that I always saw manifest by people who believed conspiracy theories. Now, not every person, because there are some who just, they're believing them for different reasons, but the people propagating and using conspiracy theories are a way to show that they're better than other people. They don't work a conviction of sin, they focus upon a problem that's outside of us instead of the problem that we need to face, which is the problem inside of us. We're worried about being deceived 
by Satan, but we're not doing the things that we need to do to not be deceived. Now, I'm just going to read a little bit more before we close here. Notice the last half of the verse. The effect of the truth is to make us free. The first half is the best promise in the Bible, if we could measure promises. But we cannot do that because one is just as important as another. All are the thoughts of God, and his thoughts are eternal. But this is an excellent promise. He shall know the truth. That is, it seems to me, is the most wonderful promise. Ye shall know the truth. Think you know it? Wonder if you know it? Wonder whether such and such a thing is true? No, sir, ye shall know the truth. That is the promise of Jesus Christ to you and to me, that when we trust in him and follow him, we shall know the truth. And as certain as we yield to him and follow him, he will take care that we know the truth and we trust him for it. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. How are we to know the truth? Continue in his word, be his disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth. Then his word is the word of truth, ye shall know the truth. We want to stick to that promise. It seems to me that if that promise were the only one in the Bible, it would be all we would need. You shall know the truth. Because Christ has promised that. This is for you and me. When we follow him and when we yield to him. And because this is so, it seems to me that we ought to be the gladdest people on the earth. For that promise given, ye shall know the truth. Now, uh, Jones here, I mean, I agree with him. Ye shall know the truth. And, and when you look at this with what he's saying, that any man who thinketh he knoweth anything knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know, and yet God says ye shall know the truth. So that truth has to be something that exposes the fact that we don't know things. Now we have these opportunities to learn the truth, as he said. There have been some already, no doubt, in just the first lessons which have been given, some opportunities already for persons in the classes to say, well, now, is that so? Probably some opportunity has already been offered for some to say, well, now, I do not know about that. There will be countless instances, doubtless, before the six weeks are past, that the Lord has given us to study his word in ways, numberless times, in which we will be called upon to say, well, now, is that so? What is the promise? He shall know the truth. Now, the Lord does not want us to take things because someone says them. God does not want us to say, when anyone, has, anyone says a thing, well, that is so because he says it. That is not the thing. We are to know it is true because God says it. And I say that there is the promise ye shall know. There will be the opportunity for the query to arise, is that so? How about that? There is the query, but there is the promise with it. Do not forget it. Jesus has said to every time, to you every time, that query arises, he shall know the truth. Then when that query arises from some thought in the lesson, that is the answer to you and me. What are we then to consider? What is the place for us to occupy just then? Here is some brother who will be speaking someday, and he will make a statement perhaps, reading a passage or two or three passages, and catch a thought there that is new to me, make an expression here that is new to me, and the query comes, well, now is that so? What is the answer to me? He shall know the truth. Then what am I to do just then and with that new thought, <clears throat> with that query? Am I now just to hold that query, that new thought, that which is to me a new thought? Am I not to hold that right before Christ and ask him the truth? Or wouldn't I be better to go to some of the brethren and ask, what do you think about that? Brother A says so and so. What do you think about that? That is new to me and I kind of half doubt it. Well, I doubt it too, says the other brother. Well, then, of course, it cannot be so. That settles it. It is not so. It is none of your business what I think about it. I remember once in a camp meeting, a brother read some scriptures right straight through. It was about all he did do. It was a Bible reading. But the thoughts he brought out in the Bible reading were new to a large number in the audience. About half a dozen came in a flock to me and asked, well, now, Brother Jones, what do you think about that? And I said, it is none of your business what I think about it. What do you think about it yourself? 
Well, we do not know what to think about it, they replied. And I said, find out. Suppose I had said, I do not believe it. Then they would have gone off and said, I do not believe that because Brother Jones said he did not. Suppose I had said it was so. They would have said, that is so. Brother Jones says that it is so. So I propose to tell you nothing about what I think. It is none of your business. You know for yourselves what is truth. That is the position I propose to occupy in this institute. I expect to find some things coming out here that are new. And I've never found a meeting yet where we have studied the Bible that the Lord did not give us something that was new, beautiful, grand, and glorious. But the place I propose to occupy is right upon that promise. You shall know the truth. Um, but I find people, and doubtless you have too, who seem to get upon the idea that the only sure way to know the truth is to raise all the objections they can and have them answered. But when I have raised and presented all the objections I know against the point, and they are all answered, then am I sure what is truth? Am I sure of it? No, because there are, obje are objections I never thought of. Don't you see? Now, this is, of course, the scientific method. Um, the idea, well, we can never know the truth because there's always objections that we could bring against it. On that line, I can never be sure that it is the truth until every objection that is possible is brought against it by every mind in the universe. Can I be sure of it until then? Well, these are all answered. Would When these are all answered, would that make me sure it was so? And if it would, how can, how can I live long enough to hear all the objections answered? Can we get at the truth in that way? Is there any possibility of getting at the truth by raising objections and having them answered? No, sir. What is the use of starting on a road of which you will never reach the end a wrong road, of course, but not start on it at all. Another word, can there be any objections against the truth? Think of that closely. Well, when someone is presented and you and I are to say, I see an objection against that. Is that the position we are to take? No, we are to ask whether it is the truth. And if there is no objection, there can be no objection against it. Our objection is a fraud, don't you see? thing we are to ask is, is it true? So when we look at, and just, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to read the rest of this. This goes on quite a bit. But what we can see here is that we can know the truth. And we can know the truth because we, we don't trust in ourselves. It's the Holy Spirit. It's God who reveals what is truth. And truth is true. It's not error. When we've looked at how, how, how is it that we've come to believe the things that we believe, let's say with July 18th, how did we come to believe in July 18th? Have we brought up every objection? Why do we believe in it? Have we done what Jones has asked us to do? I don't believe so. Okay, so you don't believe we've asked, because have we examined, if we believe it's the truth, we would believe it's the truth on what basis? Why would we believe July 18, 2020? was a, a correct uh, date, even though the event did not happen. Because people can bring up objections. So how do we know that it's true? Because we can see examples and symbols of it independently throughout scripture. Right. So all through the Bible, all of this study that we have done has bear, borne witness that it is true. Now, some people could bring up objections. I mean, I've thought of lots of objections here and there as I've studied chronology. And I know some of the objections. Uh, even Adventism, you can have this objection. Well, we can't prove the 2300 days. There are things that we can't answer. Is that a reason to reject the 2300 days? No. No. 
Because do we know everything? Absolutely not. Yeah. So a scholar can look at, you know, well, um, Artaxerxes began his reign in the spring, and we know exactly when his reign was, and we know the seventh year of his reign went from the spring of 1848 to the eight, spring of 18, or 1840, 458 to 457. And so if Ezra's journey was going to happen, it would have happened had to happen in 458. And you can look at all these objections to what Adventism say. Or you could say Jesus couldn't possibly have been crucified on a fr Friday in 40 in 31 AD um, because, you know, th the calendar works a certain way and we don't believe that it was possible for uh, Christ to be crucified on a Friday. But of course, a lot of these objections can be answered. I've answered them without even being a scholar, just by studying God's word comparing scripture with scripture. But when somebody brings up an objection and asks for it to be answered, will they ever bring up all the objections, as Joan said? If, because isn't often the objections that they're bringing up because they don't want to receive the truth? Yes. There's a usually the reason. Because when we see something in the scriptures and it's powerful, and then we go and reason. I mean, this is what happened in um, 2011. Um, I was at uh, a camp meeting down in Oregon and uh, Ty Gibson was there. And some of you may know the story. Ty Gibson and um, David Ashrick and uh, uh, James Rafferty. I only saw Ty when I was there. I guess the others must have showed up later. But uh, I believe they had um, Dario Taylor, or maybe it was uh, um, Emiliano, I'm not sure, Emiliano Richards. But anyway, they, they presented the 2520 to these three men. And these three men said, this is amazing. But they had a vested interest in it not being true because uh, one of their biggest um, uh, contributors in money uh, was interested in this message. And they really just went to listen to it to find out how they could pick flaws with it. So even though they saw it, they saw the witness of it, what they had to do was create an objection to it. And Ty Gibson's a pretty smart guy, and he came up with an objection. Now, his objection is faulty, but it didn't stop him from giving this objection to the 2520. So when a person isn't interested in the truth, they can find all kinds of objections to the truth. I run into people who have objections all the time for all kinds of truths that they could easily find in Scripture that they could believe just by reading the scriptures, by comparing scripture with scripture, but they have objections. They have these doubts why it mustn't be true because one little thing doesn't seem to fit their understanding. And if we approach things that way, what would we believe? As Jones is saying, we would have to really believe nothing we could never be certain of anything. And don't we have a sure word of prophecy? Yes. And it's as a light that shineth in a dark place, is it not? The truth is a light that shines in a dark place. It's that sure word of prophecy. So we can be certain of things. We can be certain that things are true because they are light. They expose darkness. And that darkness is in ourselves because that's where the light has to enter. It had to, had to enter into us, into our minds, into our being, and expose the things in us that are unlike Christ, that are error, that are false, that are sin. And only then can we know the truth. And only then can the truth make us free. Correct? 
Yes. Because to be free is to be free from sin. Otherwise, we're a slave to sin. So this is righteousness by faith. Jones is presenting righteousness by faith just in how to understand truth. But many people approach righteousness by faith who believe, say they believe in righteousness by faith, would not accept what Jones is teaching. Even if they could intellectually assent and say, well, it's Jones and it must be true. They're not going to believe it because they're not going to do it. If you believe something to be true, you're going to do what it says. So I know there's a lot of thoughts here, but um, we're going to leave it at that for that tonight. Um, any final comments? I know Dwight has a presentation tomorrow, and I'm pretty sure. Lots uh, are you going to uh, – this paper by uh, Jones, are you going to put it on the email? I, I emailed this to everyone already. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah, a couple right. weeks ago or so. A couple yeah. weeks? Yeah, it was in the same email that I sent. Um, uh, September 8th? Was it September 8th? Um, no, well, I don't know the date. Um, yeah, because I sent, uh, um, I can't think of her name. We've been, we studied her paper last week. Um, Leona, Leona Dawson's paper. So it was in the email where I sent that. So it might have been September 8th. Yeah. So so eight days ago. Okay. Okay. And, and Dwight has a presentation tomorrow morning. I'm pretty sure he's going to present a lot of what things that agree with what we've just read here. Correct. Dwight, is do I have that right, that you're going to be presenting things that I don't know yet, but it's very possible. Okay. Because it seems to be that's how it goes. It's okay. been going that way, but that's been the Lord leading. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for the Sabbath. And for each person studying your word, we just pray that your Holy Spirit can continue to work upon our hearts. We ask for your angels' care and protection. You know all things, you know what we need, even before we need it, and we trust in your guidance and leading, even if it seems to go against our nature. We pray, Lord, that uh, you can lead us into all truth. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. Be with us through the rest of this Sabbath, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.